Uh, yeah, so let's try to be as concrete as possible as a follow-up from the talk from this morning and from what we've heard already. So let's start with some noise consideration. So here you just see the plotter of some two amplitude value. So I've selected 100 kilohertz and one kilohertz here. And then, of course, if you want to check the SNR, then you see that the signal to noise ratio here, it's lower than this, this blue one. Of course, we could also uh, look directly at the standard deviation and mean value as a way to be a bit more quantitative. And so here we see that, of course, the signal is more or less the same at 7 millivolt, but here we have 500 nanovolt, and here we have 1.8 microvolt. So the orange is, of course, noisier. We can put them on the same scale, and then it's even more obvious. So, uh, yeah, so that's definitely... Uh, yeah, so two type of uh, noise consideration. So that would be for the time domain. So we just see the, 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 the data being uh, streamed, but uh, I also would like to look at it in the, in the frequency domain. So we can basically run the spectrum. So in this case, uh, we look at our peak here. Uh, so we don't need to have this mode. Yeah, we, we only look at one of them that is good. And then we can look also in the scope. So in the scope, of course, now we are exciting with 10 millivolt uh, or, or less. So everything is good. But then if we keep on uh, decreasing it, so the amplitude will eventually, of course, get weaker and weaker until at some point, basically, from the scope, it's tough to be to see anything at all. Of course, in the spectrum, we still see it. And then we could uh, use um, the FFT instead. And in the FFT, yeah, if we kind of zoom, we also we still see it as well. But we can further reduce it. So now it's 100 microvolt excitation. Maybe I should also change the scale here so that we have a bit more resolution. Same on the input here. And I keep on decreasing it until even in the scope FFT, we don't see anything. So here it's getting it's getting tough for the lock, for the for the for the scope. We can start to make maybe some averaging, so the bandwidth limit, we can do some persistence. And now we can still resolve it. Uh, but uh, of course, we can see it also in the lock-in. And now if you really go to my one microvolt, uh, then if I stop with uh, the persistence, and now even if I do it, so whatever I want to do, there is no way I can uh, I can recover this, this value from a lock-in while sorry from the scope while from the lock in spectrum we still see it here so uh yeah with one microvolt excitation i still can measure the the signal in the locking so of course for you this is obvious but there is another way why uh the locking is also better uh so for instance if you introduce some modulation so now let me introduce some am modulation here so of course i'm saturating the input so that we have more harmonic so I can just here yeah, do again this here. So typically, so you see, by the way, so there is a red flag, which so just means that the overload output. So now I can clear it here. And um, yeah, so in the spectrum, I see these two amplitude modulated signal. I can see them in the group too. But uh, of course, with a much poorer resolution. So here I'm having 8,000 points. Here I'm also having 8,000 points. But with the uh, spectrum, which is the FFT of the demodulated output, I have a resolution of 1.6 hertz, while in the scope, I have only 220. Of course, I could keep on uh, increasing here the number, you know, and maybe do a, a, yeah, a reset. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's getting really uh, resource intensive for still a resolution that is much lower from what you get here with lower amount of points. So that's a way that I like to uh, illustrate between so-called smart data and big data, because the scope is really just capturing everything, but it, mean, it requires a lot of resource to, to filter offline. While if you do everything on an FPGA in real time, you output a very much lower amount of data, but still have very good resolution. And of course, if I would be uh, going even to 100 hertz, uh, modulation. So you see it here. Huh? So you see it right away. So it was a little bit like in the screenshot that I was showing before. So it's it's quite clear. 
I could even increase the resolution here, but it's not required. While in the scope, you know, basically if I remove, so you kind of have it, but it's really poorly resolved. So I think there is no brainer why the, 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 the lock-in is better, uh, but it's, it's nice to see this. And, uh, and at the same time, you can record it because if you would again, look at the time domain, so uh, let me do uh, something like this. So basically an amplitude modulated signal means that I have some modulation. I have a carrier, one kilo, 100 kilohertz, one megahertz, whatever you want. And then you have some signal that is being uh, modulated either in amplitude or in phase. So that's what will carry the information that you want to record. And the locking is just recording this, um, this envelope. And of course, because it's all digitally available, you can do this, let's say, uh, from trigger. So normally on the SPM, you would have an end of line trigger for the end of line of your uh, scan generator. And then you could uh, basically record this uh, directly as an image. So here, so here I'm recording uh, the amplitude. So it's basically the envelope of this guy. And if I had uh, recorded also the sidebands, I could also do that with the sidebands here or with the phase of the sidebands, yeah, and so on. So, and there I would not be limited by two or three or four. I could have 16 channels simultaneously, which is of course very, very important if you're doing a multi-frequency technique. Okay, so this is for kind of, uh, let's say basic noise consideration, or the advantage of locking. But now uh, let me uh, switch, switch gear and load uh, something where we can play with the resonator because that was uh, the, what we wanted to do. Yeah. So I can do this from the configuration from the, yeah. so I can basically just load some different settings. Now we have put uh, 1.8 uh, megahertz resonator just to a quartz to play with this. And uh, yeah, to see also the advantage of this uh, resonance enhancement and, and Q control. So, um, yeah, so locking is still the, the most important uh, tab. And uh, here I only need to excite with uh, 10 millivolts. So here, this, this is on, but it's, it's actually zero, so it's not affecting. And I'm just doing now a so-called, uh, yeah, I'm doing a sweep of the resonance. So that's what everybody does for, for locking the PLL. Uh, and that's what we can also call an open loop transfer function. So while we do this, so uh, yeah, let's focus only on amplitude and phase. So we can of course do the sweeping. So the Q factor is high, but we can still sweep uh, at a good pace. And of course we see the resonance. Uh, yeah, we, we, we see this sweep here. So the inflection point at the resonance. So. In this case, there is probably no need to play with Q control, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's nice to uh, to to also e explain how it works. So here we have four PIDs. Uh, so the first one I can use as a PLL, the second one I can use as a automatic gain controller, and then I still have three and four where I can play with uh, the X and Y component as I was uh, showing this morning, and I only have a gain, so of one or 10 or minus 10. So that will just be the amplification factor. And I'm combining these two, two waves. So these two waves, so now they're, they're not outputting anything. And I can uh, just now feed through whatever I get with some phase shift and some amplitude change. So here I have the signal at zero and 19 degrees. And here I'm, I'm uh, controlling both amplitude that will be combined. So now I have the superposition of three sine wave. So I have a uh, sine one, which is 10 millivolt at, in this case, uh, 1.8. Actually, the frequency is the same. Huh? Q control is always for a fixed frequency. So at the moment, there is no PLL. It's just a one fixed frequency. But I'm uh, having two different amplitudes here, which, of course, when you add two signals that are at the same frequency, then uh, you can also have a detuning. And uh, and now if I do another sweep, so typically uh, not, not this one here. So so let's keep this in mind. So 16 kilo, uh, yeah, 16 k for the Q factor, 1.8 megahertz for the resonance, 
a set point for the phase that is close to zero. And now do another sweep with some, with some gain. And uh, I'm also plotting the PID value of three and four. So the PID three is actually acting on the amplitude. The PID four is acting directly on the phase, so a bit like a phase shifter. So here I'm actually damping the, the Q factor. And, uh, and you see this uh, quite well. So uh, especially when you start to be at resonance, so you're adding these two signal. And so instead of having the normal native resonance, I'm, I'm basically uh, yeah, reducing the amplitude. So by a, a large amount, so that the effective output is now dropped to this value. Same for the phase. So normally I would have this phase here. Actually, I could I can maybe uh, plot it in red. So that would be uh, our reference uh, curve. So the let, let's say the native resonance, and uh, and 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 uh, and here I have actually a phase that is 180 degree phase shifted here compared. So that when I add them together, they are really uh, lagging even more. So this phase now slope is lower than this one. So we can get now the Q from both value. So they are kind of similar. So either we use you know the F over delta F, so the full width at half maximum of the fit of the Lorentzian, or we take the slope, so the D phi over D F, like that was in the presentation. So here we have, let's say, 10 or 11 uh, Q factor. And, uh, and now if I want to boost, I just need to uh, invert the sign. So here I will add more amplitude and I will add more phase lag so that uh, we can see the difference again uh, in the sweep. Yeah, so it's this one. So in the beginning, the Q control is not doing much of a difference. So it's only when there is this large deviation from the, uh, from the wave at the resonance. So as I explained this before the break, so typically what we want is that uh, we want to modify the open loop transfer function. So that would be the native one. And now by rectifying, even we at a fixed frequency, then we can boost here the amplitude or damp it. And now we can also, and now you see, so maybe I can make it a bit clearer by uh, removing some, so that would be, uh, yeah, uh, history, sorry, yeah. So if you really just focus on uh, the one where we increase the Q, so you see that the phase here is added much more lag, much more, uh, yeah, much more phase so that the slope is, is then high. So here they were just on two different scale, but you could also put them on the same scale and then you really see the difference. Yeah. So that's really a way to boost the amplitude. Of course, so far, so good. This is only the, the open loop, so it does not matter whether you are closing the PLA. But now let's let's close the PLL not on the native resonance, but on the on the boosted resonance. So to see if we can indeed have a better SNR. So uh, and maybe um, yeah, maybe I will do it first uh, with the native resonance still, because then we can know what is the actual uh, resonance. What, what is the actual SNR? So for this, I will use the first the first PID. So I'm using the typical uh, resonator frequency model amplitude. So this is what I have. As I said, the Q factor for the native resonance is 16K. So I'm using just a target bandwidth of, uh, of uh, one kilohertz because it's a one megahertz resonator. So I have plenty of bandwidth. And then uh, I'm just copying this value now to the PID. So that was my set point, that was my center frequency, and then I can basically uh, look at, uh, at uh, yeah, I can close the loop. And then you see here that it is indeed uh, locked. I could, uh, yeah, that's not a big deal. I can improve here the input uh, range sensitivity. And if I check uh, yeah, the frequency, uh, I see that it is indeed locked.
So he went from this value to here. But what we want is actually to look at the SNR. So let's uh, let's do it like this. So first of all, we see that the noise is Gaussian because we have. Uh, so we so we know that the noise is white because it's a Gaussian, and uh, and then we see uh, our SNR from basically this 1.8 megahertz and this 430 millihertz standard deviation. So let's keep everything constant. So we don't touch the amplitude, we don't touch the bandwidth, we don't touch anything else. And we just keep in mind this 400 uh, millihertz standard deviation. And now uh, let's uh, do the same with while, while we boost the Q. So I'm just now stopping the PLL. I'm again uh, doing this as we had before. And uh, yeah, normally, so that's the one, uh, yeah, I'm just checking that we are still same as before, so that we indeed boost. And now, instead of using the Q that I had before of 16K, I will use the Q that is measured, which is more like uh, 30K. Yeah, this is what we have. Okay. So basically, for the PLL, I'm doing the same as before except that because I know that the, the Q is not 16K anymore, it is 30K, I can use different value for the, for the advisor. In principle, the set point has not changed. So we don't need to drive to other um, amplitude. And so I'm now sending that to the PID and I can close the loop again. So, and run, the, run this one here. So again, I'm doing here. And now I'm doing uh, maybe a two lower value. And now we see it's 230 millihertz. So I don't know if you remember, it was 400 and now we got 200. So we boosted the Q factor by a factor of two. And we do have, uh, yeah. So, so that's a way to boost the S SNR, but that's because probably we also boost the amplitude. Yeah, and uh, yeah. And of course, we could do it the other way around. So uh, yeah, basically now uh, going to a lower value here. So I'm, now I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, to the 11 k that I had before. So uh, something like, uh, yeah. So yeah, plus 10 and plus 10, I could... Uh, I, and then uh, here I just entered 11K because this is the new effective Q uh, values that we get from this. Yeah. And now I'm still running the PLL. Yeah, so I just have to yeah, look again like this. And now it's more like 600 millihertz. So the standard deviation so we had three values of the standard deviation for the same amplitude, the same uh, drive frequency, uh, because the PLL itself is at the same value, but the standard deviation, uh, yeah. Effectively, what we have is that we have a different slope. So typically here, the slope that we have here is different. So the PLL does not care. What it what, what it only sees what the uh, slope is here. As I said, in the end, we don't we don't care about the the shape of the resonance here. A, a PID only work as a slope around the set point with a linear response, and uh, so basically this fit here. And uh, yeah, so I I thought that this is quite uh, uncommon because uh, there are many people who are using Q control but without the PLL. And so there is a nice way now to do also uh, both together and to kind of engineering the type of queue to also uh, play with, uh, with the SNR. And now there is another thing that we can also consider. So of course now, uh, by the way, so to, to complete now the, the measurement. So you see we have already three loops. So one, two here and one here. And then we can also get an amplitude feedback. So that would be now the fourth PID. So typically now looking at uh, uh, yeah so-called resonator frequency here so 11k blah blah so here I'm using a target bandwidth as I said that is significantly lower than the PLL bandwidth because the PLL has to be adjusted before we adjust the amplitude 
and I'm sending now this new value here. So, uh, and you can check again the PID. So, so is a plotter. It's in auto. Yeah. So when I close the loop, I see, yeah, it's actually now just superimposed. So now I have my frequency that is locked. I have my amplitude that is locked with an effective Q factor here of 11K, which is not native. And of course, uh, if I play with, uh, yeah, uh, with the set point, Yeah, um, no, but yeah, it should be, uh, yeah, I can look at. Uh... Yeah, but well, no, the PID is not working because it was not on. So that's something uh, stupid for me. So now it is on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Voilà. So now it's going to the set point values that we have asked. So again, I can just now, yeah, look at this. So I was asking uh, 3.8 milli. Uh, yeah. So PID2. Yeah, I'm checking what was the value. It's 1.8. Ah, okay, so basically you would need more than 40 milli uh, to do it. Yeah, so I can just put a set point of, uh, yeah, 1 milli. So let me put a yeah, yeah, set point of 1 milli. And yeah, close the loop. Okay. So that was the last part that was, yeah, supposed to work, but uh, yeah, not this time. Hundred milli, yeah, yeah. But typically, you can get uh, yeah up to four PIDs here. So the the one that is used for Q control, you can use the one for the PLL. And you could also have an additional one on the amplitude, so that four in total for the same instrument. And uh, yeah. so that shows quite the flexibility that you get from a single, uh, and it, this guy, which only has one input, one output here. And maybe one last thing that I can show, it's uh, basically the PID set point sweep. So uh, typically now I can use another sweeper. So uh, this one, ah, yeah, okay. So maybe I was, I, uh, yeah, I did not do this. Yeah. One one thing that is actually important when you want to close the PID, it's of course uh, to characterize the system uh, in open loop here. So, and you can get also the slope. So here yeah, it's 30 millivolt per volt, which is, uh, yeah, probably, what I've entered here. Ah, okay. I'm, I'm, I need this this one here. Yeah. yeah. So now it's working. So you see here the value, and uh, and you probably see better in the plotter again. So the value of R, and if I change the value here, yeah. So you see that now the, the feedback is also good on the amplitude. So, so while the Q control is working, you can still have the dissipation on the amplitude together with the PLL. So now you really have the four loops that are closed. Of course, it's tricky because the PLL needs to be the fastest in order to be able to have the right amplitude. The amplitude needs to be faster before 
to, to keep the resonator. And then you have the Q control, which is going to be uh, lower because the, the frequency has to be updated before any of the loops can be closed. Yeah, okay. So here we have these four PIDs. Um, yeah, I, actually, I just jump one step, which uh, you see how important it is to make uh, a good open loop uh, measurement first, uh, because yeah, this PID two, because the in output of the PID is the amplitude two and the input is R2. This is exactly what I was plotting here, sorry. I'm plotting here the output of PID two and I'm measuring the input, but of course in, in, in open loop to get this right uh, fitting parameter. Okay, and then one last part, because I think yeah, I'm, I'm still good, right? Yeah, uh, let's use yet another sweeper. So uh, yeah, we actually have, uh, maybe that's an, a good way to show how very uh, important uh, the sweeper tool is, because maybe I haven't insisted here, but here you can uh, not only um, sweep the frequency or the amplitude, uh, but uh, so that's really a way to explore your parameter space that I like to say, but also understand it uh, better what's going on and how to optimize everything. But now there is something quite uh, special on this one is that you can indeed uh, sweep the PID set point. So PID one is actually the PLL. So PLL is here. So I have to, because I want to look at the amplitude, I cannot have the, amp the amplitude controller, but I have the PLL on. The set point is around, let's say zero. So let me sweep now the PLL set point between, I don't know, minus 20 and 20. And I can record, so the amplitude, uh, the frequency and the phase. So that would be uh, this one here. And uh, and of course, I have to do this while the PLL is running. So you see the PLL is still running. So I want the, the I want to measure now the uh, I, I want to explore basically uh, what would be the best uh, uh, set point or phase in order to get uh, this. Well, of course, now I have a Q factor of sixteen thousand. Is not the two hundred thousand that you saw this morning, but it would work as well. But of course, now instead of having a sweep in the frequency that would take minutes or more, you can take a sweep in phase that would just take a few seconds. And of course you can adjust and you can again take now the, the slope of this, uh, yeah, between here and here. So you want to take the slope of the frequency as a function of phase. So you just go here again, do a linear fit. And now you get this slope here which is in hertz per degree, huh, because it's df over d phi. And so from this, you can get a very accurate value of q, even if it's a million. And you can do that with, uh, with a very fast sweep. Yeah. So yeah, I think, uh, yeah, maybe to wrap up, but then of course I can, if you have questions, how much time do I have? Okay, good. So I was uh, particularly uh, fast. Now actually I jumped one step, so that's why. Uh, yeah, but yeah, to, to wrap up, yeah, so you can use four PID simultaneously to control uh, the Q factor, to control the PLL at the same time, and to control the dissipation. And you can, uh, or you can also just optimize it if you have very high Q by having this PID set point sweep plus noise consideration. Yeah.